Good, thank you very much Chris, and um, thank you for inviting me to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this seems like a good turnout in absolute terms, even if not in relative terms, but actually I'm slightly ashamed to say this is my first uh, Radical Anthropology Group seminar, even though I was in London for a few years, but I think in my defence you, you only moved here after I left, yes, I or think shortly true. after. Yeah, so. And we are very embarrassed that we didn't contact you earlier. So anyway, now, well, now. well I'm here. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, I'm just going to talk about hunter-gatherers today, not meerkats, although I'm happy to have a conversation about um, cooperation in non-human animals. Um, afterwards, I'll try and stick to 45 minutes. Um, so uh, yes, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist and evolutionary biologist. Um, and I tried to do a combination of three things um, to generate insights about human evolution and uh, human social organization, human cooperation, which is uh, ethnogra quantitative ethnographic fieldwork, um, computational modeling, and also kind of evolutionary theory, theorizing. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about all three of those today. Um, but I first wanted to give a bit of a sketch of um, an ethnographic sketch of the Agta, who are hunter-gatherers in the northern Philippines, uh, with whom I worked um, uh, during my PhD when I was here at UCL. Um, so the Agta, in many ways, are, are typical immediate return small-scale hunter-gatherers in that they live in small camps of around 20 adults. Um, they're highly mobile. Households move on average every two or three weeks from between uh, communities. They're generally politically egalitarian. They share food extensively um, between households. And there's a, there's a sexual division of labor, but general kind of um, s political um, equality between men and women. Um, so they fit many of the kind of, they, they basically tick most of the boxes of um, set out in um, kind of some of the classic uh, text from the 60s and 70s about what small-scale hunter-gatherers are. But in other ways, there are also uh, there are some additional interesting dimensions to the Agta. Firstly, um, they are, their primary source of protein is not uh, meat. They do hunt and gather, but they do a lot of fishing as well. Um, and they, uh, at least the, the, the communities I worked with, uh, live mostly along the coast, as you'll see in a minute, or along mountain streams. Uh, and so they kind of provide an interesting model for uh, the coastal foraging niche, which has been argued to be quite important in human evolution and especially human uh, migrations out of Africa and this sort of thing. Um, the second thing is that, like many hunter-gatherers, their way of life is changing, uh, and that across our study population, there is, uh, while there are some communities who are exclusively engaged in foraging, almost exclusively engaged in foraging, there are other communities that are increasingly doing agricultural wage labor uh, and other non-foraging work. So they provide a kind of interesting insight into that foraging to farming transition, and we've done some work on that. So the Agta are in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, and some people um, are actually surprised to, to hear that there are contemporary hunter-gatherers in Southeast Asia. Um, all of these groups a generation ago were probably primarily engaged in foraging. That's not the case now, but it is the case for some groups of the Agta in the northern Philippines. Uh, and we also, there are also hunter-gatherers in uh, southern um, Thailand and Malaysia. And of course the groups in, um, uh, in the Andaman Islands, uh, some of you might have seen the story a couple of months ago about an American um, evangelical missionary who tried to make contact with the Sentinelies and didn't come back. Some people say that's kind of... Uh, we yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, some people would say it serves him right. I, I wouldn't comment. <laughs> Couldn't possibly comment. Um, so uh, when I say that I work on hunter gatherers in the Philippines, uh, many people assume, not unreasonably, that they're kind of tucked away on a small island. Um, and the Philippines is an archipelago of 7,000 islands. Um, but funnily enough, actually, the, some of the most remote parts of the Philippines are in uh, the mountainous areas <coughs> of the two main islands, Mindanao and Luzon. And the Agta actually um, uh, live along this coastline of northeastern Luzon, which is um, quite a remote area, which is surprising given how densely populated the Philippines and Luzon is. And in the south 
well, in the southwest of Luzon is Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines, and a massive urban, urban sprawl of 20, 30 million people. Um, but uh, what's going on in the northeast is there's uh, the Sierra Madre mountain range, which cuts quite quickly down uh, to the coast. And there's no real suitable area between the mountains and the coast for rice farming, so there's never really been high population density. There are a few small small scale wet rice agriculturalists who live there, but uh, there are no roads on the left. You can see the road network around these islands from Google Maps. And um, you can see up in the northeast of Luzon, I'll try and make it there. There's no, you know, there are no roads in or out. You have to take a boat or fly in. And you can also see it on the right hand side. You can see this dark green belt of tropical forest, um, unlike the rest of Luzon, which is, um, which is mostly devoted to farming. So in this little notch on the east coast where we lived, so the, the Agta are about 10,000 people spread all along this coast. Um, and there are about 1,000 Agta in the municipality where we did our ethnography, which is a, a municipality called Palanan. And we visited about 15, 16 camps in total and collected detailed data on a whole bunch of things in 10. And so you can see here that, so within this area, you have about 1,000 Agta and about 5,000 non-Agta um, rice agriculturalists and a few fishing, a few fishing villages as well. Um, so you can actually see on this map, um, you can see around the river, these kind of um, uh, rice fields. And there's a small town here and here and a fishing village up in the, in the north. And you can see the Agta um, are located either further down river or along the coast here. Uh, in many cases, they're, in some cases, they're uh, within an hour's walk of um, agricultural settlements. In other cases, they're quite remote and you know, at least a day's walk away. Um, so the Agta are hunter-gatherers. Um, in that they hunt and gather. Uh, as, I'll, as I'll say in a minute, they also do a little fishing, but uh, the guy on the left has shot a macaque, as you can see, and make, made a kind of gruesome macaque handbag um, out of it. Um, and they also get uh, wild pigs and um, uh, Philippine brown deer, and they shoot birds and things. So is that a gun? It is a gun, yeah. That's an that's a air rifle, actually. So, um, which he's borrowed from a neighbouring farmer. That's about the most powerful thing they, they use. There's also match guns where they um, make powder out of match heads um, for the spark. So they do have guns, but not you know they're not using shotguns or anything. Um, they also some of the older guys tend to stick with bow and arrow as well, and they and they make traps. Um, they also gather. This lady, if I can get this to work, <coughs> is digging for chivas. But their primary source of protein is not meat, is it's, it's fishing. So th those groups living along the coast go diving and spearfishing in the um, coral reefs just offshore. And they're fantastic divers who can hold their breath for you know, a couple of minutes. Uh, while I bob along the surface, trying to see where they are. Uh, and they also um, fish in the, in the mountain streams, which is much easier going, especially in the summer where the water's quite clear. Um, so I would go out fishing with people, and especially in the mountain uh, streams, it was great. You could kind of grab a big rock and sink down to the bottom and hold your breath and watch them as they're fishing around. It's interesting. Um, they don't really have any, their immediate return hunter-gatherers by and large, they do do a they do smoke some fish and o octopus, as you can see here, but it rarely, their technique of smoking means that the food rarely lasts for more than um, four or five days. And it's also not great smoked, um, to be honest. Um, so, they're, so they're largely immediate return apart from, apart from this. Um, they also go after honey. Um, and when, sometimes when they hit big, they can get huge honey holes. These, uh, ladies are holding about a quarter of, um, of what they, they got in one trip. Um, and it's, it's really tasty as well. The, um, this, man is making a, oops, this man is making a backpack out of um, a banana stem and some kind of vine there. Um, and he's making that just before climbing uh, 
a tree to to get the uh, to get the honey, and on the left is uh, uh, a whole load of uh, uh, palm, leaves, palm leaves wrapped up, which they'll use to smoke out the bees. So as he goes up, someone will light it, pass it to him. He'll hang that uh, bunch on his um, on his waistband as he climbs, and, it, and, and use it to smoke out the bees. Uh, and then he'll cut the honey, stick it in the backpack and climb down, and then everyone will just leg it through the forest away from the bees. Um, uh, he wouldn't let me, actually uh, this was an unsuccessful trip I must say. Uh, people didn't want me to film them um, getting honey, but this is us walking through the forest. So, just so you can get a sense. Quite young and small. Um, it's it's primary forest. Yeah. yeah. There are some. I mean, there are some really big trees. <laughs> um, and so I did this uh, work in the Philippines as part of a group. So kind of broke from the standard lone wolf anthropologist off for years on their own um, kind of model. There were three of us, Abby Page and Dan Smith, who some of you might know. Um, uh, and we were part of a kind of big interdisciplinary team, uh, which involved Andrea and Ruth from UCL here. Uh, Mark Thomas, who's a geneticist, and we had some genetics people working on hunter-gatherer genetics. Uh, and Jerome Lewis, who I assume most of you know um, well. And uh, there were three, well, there were six evolutionary anthropology or quantitative anthropology people involved, uh, three of us in the Philippines, and three in Congo working with the Mbanjeli Bayaka, um, with whom um, Jerome has been working for some time. Um, so I, I should say that um, all of our work was, our philosophy was to do quantitative um, ethnography, to collect data on things that people did. Uh, and of course, you know, we miss the, well, there's a trade-off between kind of qualitative and quantitative research, and in, in both cases, we were studying populations that had been well studied qualitatively. There are there are several excellent social anthropology ethnographies of the actor, but no one's really systematically collected data uh, on their way of life, and that was kind of our aim. So we were basically our philosophy was we were interested not in what people say they do or what they think, but what they actually do. And I, while I appreciate there are kind of limitations of that, it has allowed us to um, um, productively answer a lot of questions, I think. We've we collected data on uh, kinship ties between everyone in the population, demography, uh, health, childcare, um, cooperation in food sharing, foraging returns, uh, and time budgets, all sorts of things. Um, and so I'm mostly actually going to talk about kinship and the social organisation of the AGTA, uh, both kind of for itself and also what it can s potentially tell us about um, human social evolution and so on. But first, actually, I wanted to show some results about uh, on time budgets, which are kind of hot off the press. So what we did, um, what we did every day was to uh, do what we called camp scans, where we say we had 30 people in the community, uh, we would have a list of names, and every three hours, starting from 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., we would. Um, make a, a, rec a record of what everyone was doing. So were they out fishing? Were they out hunting? Were they washing clothes? Were they repairing their dwelling? Were they um, breastfeeding? Were they um, having a nap? You know, um, we, had a, we had about 40 different kind of categories that we recorded, um, which is kind of a weird thing to do, but actually you can do it quite discreetly while you sit in the middle of the camp and you can basically see everything that's going on because these are small, small communities small camps and uh, everyone's dwellings are quite open and e you, know, you can kind of see what's going on at all times. There's not much privacy basically uh, for if, you're a, if you're an actor. And this allowed us to, um, for each individual, estimate how much time they spend doing different things. And we can break this down into the small categories I mentioned or we can kind of uh, build it up into things like uh, the proportion of time spent doing domestic chores, childcare, uh, out-of-camp work and, uh, and uh, leisure. 
So here this is the proportion of time from 100% to no time at all. Uh, and the grey triangles and circles are uh, the triangles of men uh, or males uh, and circles of uh, females, women. So we can see, for example, that uh, this man was 40 years old and spent about half his time at leisure. And then we can plot for men and women uh, of across their lifetimes um, or across, yeah, from, um, from age like 2 to 80, what in, in general, what proportion of time they spend doing these different things. So we can see, I think the most interesting thing for me is that leisure time um, is pretty similar for both men and women. I mean, you can see a small difference here, but it wouldn't be statistically significant. Basically, men and women have spent exactly the same amount of time at leisure, which at its minimum is still 25% of their time. The interesting thing is then, on top of that, the rest of their time budget is actually quite different. Uh, in, at least in terms of out-of-camp work versus childcare, which is um, uh, basically for, so what we look at, the blue line, dashed line is, is uh, men, and the solid red line is women. So we can see that for women, um, basically once they, once they hit the age of starting to have their first child, the proportion of time spent in out-of-camp work uh, declines before it picks up again after a typical age of last, last birth. Um, and conversely, you can see women are doing much more childcare than men. Um, this is kind of, I think this is similar to what's been reported for, say, the Hadza, where um, it's, I think it's especially the case for women with very young children under the age of two uh, before they've been weaned. Uh, there is a big time budget problem imp imposed by that, it would seem. And actually, in, in my foraging return data, where I collected data on how many calories, or estimated how many calories per day, different people, um, how many calories people brought into camp. Uh, if we compare husbands and wives who have children under the age of two, there's a big difference. Uh, women are producing very little and men are producing uh, a great deal. But if they're youngest child is older than two, so even if they're three or four, there's actually not much difference in how much time men and women are spending out of camp. And actually, per hour, men and women seem to be just as productive uh, in how many calories they can produce. So I really think the difference in kind of overall foraging productivity of men and women and the bottom left is, is, is really just a function of uh, the demands of um, childcare. But despite having these kind of despite this kind of classic sexual division of labour, the overall amount of leisure time remains, remains the same. That's my reading of it, anyway. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we have um, these data for 10 camps that vary in the extent to which they engage in foraging versus non other non-foraging work, by which I mean primarily agricultural wage labour and kind of what I call commercial foraging. So um, the actor will, for cash, go and collect things like rattan cane in the forest, which can be used to make furniture. Um, and occasionally they also um, uh, are commissioned to go and find bird's nest, which, uh, bird's nest, which ultimately find their way onto the Chinese um, market. Um, so we're able to test a kind of age-old hypothesis about the the effect of the transition from foraging to farming on time budgets and how much leisure time uh, we have. Because I think um, since, since the first hunter, kind of thorough hunter-gatherer ethnography started to be produced in the 60s and 70s, there was this argument that hunter-gatherers are the original or an original affluent society. That was an argument Marshall Salins made um, in that they have, they might not have a great deal of material wealth, but they do have a lot of uh, leisure time, uh, and that this is lost when they adopt farming. Now, this is an interesting hypothesis, but it's actually quite difficult to test when you're comparing between populations, um, because you could have, okay, maybe farmers in Papua New Guinea work harder than foragers in the Kalahari, but it's difficult to know whether those differences are caused by differences in economy, namely foraging or farming, or whether they're caused by differences in the environment or differences in the kind of social or cultural history of the groups. In our case, we have 10 groups from the same population with kinship ties, they speak the same language, culturally the same, but they vary in how much foraging versus farming. So when we, uh, yeah, and we can see here's the 10 camps and 
So for example, in camp number nine, down the bottom, uh, in green, this is the mean number of hours per day spent, adults spend foraging. That's men and women put together. So we, but the point is, they do a lot of foraging and not much non-foraging out of camp work. In other camps, they're doing just a little bit of foraging and mostly agricultural wage labor. So in, in these graphs, we're looking at on the x-axis, um, this is the proportion of out of camp work that is uh, non-foraging. So if they're zero, that means they're entirely foragers. Uh, and up to here, 80 means that 80% of when they're out of camp working is non-foraging work. So farming and foraging, basically. And we can see, even though we only have 10 camps, um, you can see that as a greater engagement in non-foraging is associated with a decrease in leisure time and quite a substantial increase in work time from about 20-25% of the time to about 35% of the time. Um, which Can which you break that down by sex at all? That's what yeah. men, because that's actually count. Um, yes, yeah, so did I, I didn't include it there. I, so I'm only just starting to go through these results, um, like literally last week. So these two results are both significant. When you plot it for men and women individually, <laughs> Uh, both are significant for men and women, but the slope for women is great. So women are more affected by, so women are working harder in more uh, agricultural camps. Now, why that is, I don't know. It could go either way. It could be that agri agriculture is harder work and requires kind of all hands on deck, or it could be that agriculture is so easy that we all can just go for a nice day out and spend the whole day farming uh, and get, get paid something, you know. Uh, my, my intuition, it would be the former, but it, it you know. So I'm still, still, still working for us, really. Uh, ooh. So, oh yes. So the time budget data, which is, um, which is the new kind of analysis, um, kind of supports the idea that foraging to farming is, um, uh, associated with a deteriorated standard of living, p potentially. But actually, that claim is reinforced by some previous findings, um, um, mainly done by Abby Page um, a few years ago, where we looked at... So in this case, we're not looking at the continuum of the camps. We've just t binned it into two groups. Those camps, or people in, in camps engaging uh, a lot in foraging, so that's the high foraging camps in orange, or not much foraging at all, which is in, in the blue. So we can see that in this case, let's say the more farming camps in blue, uh, they actually have higher fertility and higher reproductive success, but, low, um, but also higher mortality. Um, and they also have a greater kind of, uh, so Avi uh, did kind of self-report interviews where we got a sense for how often they, and, and members of their households got sick. Uh, and also, Abby did some uh, stuff looking at uh, markers of white blood cell markers of uh, infection, and they were higher for the more sedentary agricultural camps. So essentially, it looks like the overall idea that f the initial transition from foraging to farming is associated with a deteriorated, deteriorated standard of living is supported. Um, but it also pr kind of suggests a potential mechanism for why foragers would. Um, do something that is detrimental um, to their health and well-being, which is that it is associated with in increased fertility. I mean, that's not necessarily why individuals would adopt farming, but you can see how farmers would start to outcompete foragers if we're thinking about like the Neolithic transition and so on. Um, so, um, the this is kind of moving on to the the meat of the talk, really which is hunter-gatherer um, uh, residential patterns. So I want to start with the observation that humans are um, a very successful species biologically, uh, and that this is it due in large part to our ability to cooperate with strangers or unrelated individuals, and to have cumulative cultural adaptations. Even as hunter-gatherers, we were Able, we've been able to uh, colonize six of the seven continents and live in semi you know, in arid semi deserts, in um, tropical rainforests, and in the high Arctic. And we also have created fantastically complex societies, and we live in massive um, cities and have 
wonderful technology and, and, and all this. And the question is, what does this situation, the small-scale hunter-gatherer um, context and, evolution, uh, and, a, and an evolutionary history of hunting and gathering, what can that tell us about um, uh, complex societies and, and life in the post-industrial world? Um, some people think not very much. Uh, this is a quote from Paul Seabright, who was uh, my boss in a, in a previous job, so I don't mind um, ribbing him a bit. But in his introduction to book um, uh, The Company of Strangers, uh, he, he had this passage which said that like the chimpanzee, humans were violent, mobile, intensely suspicious of strangers, and used to hunting and fighting in bands of close relatives. Uh, yet now, with the development of agriculture and complex societies, the same shy, murderous ape that had avoided strangers throughout its evolutionary history was now living, working, and moving among complete strangers in their millions. Um, well, I, it's a rhetorical device, and I'm making a bit of a straw man of it, but, um, so I, I don't want to be too harsh on it. But um, I would disagree, and I'm, I'm sure many of you would. Um, I think that actually what's going on here, our ability to cooperate with strangers, to come up with technological innovations and so on um, is not achieved in spite of our hunter-gatherer evolutionary history but because of it um, and many of the things which are going on here are um, kind of capacities that evolved uh, in response to the demands of a, a hunting and gathering way of life um, so in general I disagree but there's one particular thing that kind of caught my attention which is that uh, human hunter-gatherers um, lived in bands of close relatives. Um, that's uh, something that can be empirically um, tested. Uh, so I kind of got interested in that. Um, and we did this for the actor. We, we uh, were able to collect data on how everyone in the community was uh, related to each other. So for every individual, um, we would, this was uh, Rosalind, we would um, ask her as, m as much as she possibly knew about her ancestors and cousins and where are they living and who are they married to. Some people um, didn't know a great deal or weren't particularly keen on talking about, talking about it and interviews didn't last that long. This is a case of a not particularly great interview uh, and quite poorly made notes. But uh, in other cases people were happy to talk for hours about, um, about their family history and so on. I, I mean, I'm sure it, it would be the same here. But this allowed us to put together a genealogy for the entire population um, and then therefore work out individuals who live in the same camp, how are they related to each other. So um, we did this for the Agta and the same in Congo with the Bayaka. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is our data for our two groups plus data on the Ache, who are hunter-gatherers from Paraguay and the Juhansi, I'm pronouncing it wrong, but uh, otherwise known as the Kung from uh, Namibia, Botswana, from the Kalahari. And in each case, the pie chart is um, the proportion of co-resident dyads that fall into different relatedness categories. So, if uh, I went to a community and there were, there were 20 adults living there, um, a 20 by 20 matrix, is, there are 400 dyads, um, 400 kind of ways in which someone living in the group is related to someone else. What proportion of those dyads are uh, primary kin, which is siblings, parents and um, children, uh, and distant kin, which is everything up to second cousins. Uh, and then we have a whole load of what we call affinal categories, which is uh, kin through marriage. So um, your spouse, your spouse's primary kin, so that's your, you know, in my case, my wife's brother and sister, uh, spouse's distant kin, my wife's cousins, primary kin spouses are my sister's husband. Um, so the take-home message from all of these is that in all four there's quite a similar pattern with about half of individuals in the group being very distantly related or completely unrelated uh, and only about a quarter of them actually being um, genetic kin and even in that case it includes distant kin and for some strange reason they put relatedness to oneself in the pie chart which I didn't ask just to make it comparable but the point is actually you know, relatedness in these groups is not that high. Um, which is something I'll come back to. But the other question is whether, um, whether, whether the Agta and other hunter-gatherer groups, uh, what kind of resident system they have. So we have, I mean, um, uh, I think you, you spoke about this recently, 
Probably, although, yeah. Well, you probably should be familiar with it. We have at least half the people that are pretty much new, so okay. I wasn't, wasn't really shy of explaining things. So there are, there are kind of three stand kind of classic uh, residence systems we can imagine one in which uh, there would be matrilocality which is when uh, women um, as it were stay stay put and live with their female kin um, with their sisters and mothers and aunts and nieces and so on uh, and when men leave the group to marry so if I were getting married I would go and live with my wife and her kin uh, the alternative or the 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 inverse is patrilocality where groups are composed of, or primarily composed of, male kin, and women leave the group to marry. Uh, there's also an alternative kind of bilocal scenario where either um, men or women can leave. I mean, it's always conceptualized as uh, what a newly married couple do, which I think is not necessarily that useful, but for sake of kind of characterizing the systems, that's, 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 what, that's what we mean. There's also, there's also an alternative which is neo-locality where um, uh, a newly married couple would go and live somewhere where they have no kin, which is I suppose what we do really, um, unless you go you know, move back in with your parents or something. The, uh, uh, but that's kind of, that's quite rare for um, small scale society. So the question is what are, what system to hunt together has fall into. Now, um, uh, for a long time people assumed that humans were patrilocal, something Chris has written about and Camilla. Um, and uh, to be fair, I, it's not an unreasonable starting assumption, in my opinion, insofar as our closest evolutionary um, cousins, chimpanzees, are female dispersal. Uh, but then again, if we're going to kind of evolutionary precedent, then the majority of primates and mammals are the other way around. Males tend to disperse and females stay put. Um, and uh, in non-foraging small-scale societies, uh, we see some matrilocality and patrilocality, but uh, in farming societies anyway, patrilocality is probably more common than matrilocality. So if you had, if you had no awareness of hunter-gatherers, it would probably would be a fair assumption that they, it was a justifiable assumption that they're local. But uh, as people started doing ethnographies in the 60s and 70s, they realized that actually uh, this isn't the case. The patch local band model kind of goes out the window. Hunter gatherers are um, uh, much more flexible in their res residence, and often uh, female kin are living together. Male kin are also sometimes living together. But in some groups like the Hadza, there would pref be a preference for women to stay living with their mothers. Uh, in a way that men didn't stay living with their mothers or fathers. So in some cases, it, it, it was certainly a, a, f a flexible system, uh, potentially with a, with a kind of um, tendency toward natural locality. Um, this is, well, so, uh, I mean, um, Chris has got an article which early human kinship was matrilineal, is that the? So I would agree that early human kinship was mat matrilocal. Uh, but I would also say it's patrilocal, and it was also bilocal. If, I think if there's only, uh, I think if you can, the one thing about hunter gatherers is flexibility, both within societies and between hunter gatherer societies, in the kind of residential forms we see. I think that's the the only one thing we truly know about hunter gatherers in evolutionary history is that they did all sorts of different things in different environments. That's my that's my take. <laughs> and in fact, you know, uh, in the in this paper from which the Ache and Johansi data were derived paper in 2011 by Kim Hill, uh, they actually tabulated a whole load of data from 32 hunter-gatherer societies um, and in each case, I mean I just put the table up to show that there's lots of, there's lots of data <laughs> um, what we have is on average for men how many primary kin are they living with, so that's uh, siblings, parents, and children. And is that significantly greater, statistically significantly greater, than the number of primary kin that women are living with? And this is ordered from more male bias to more female bias at the bottom. And basically, in blue we can see that there are some groups who are um, substantially more male biased, and other groups that are more female biased. But most of them are actually in the middle. There's no, there's no difference in, in um, uh, in residential, in, in 
there's sex equality in residence, basically. And I mean, I must say that I think all anthropologists are biased toward their understanding of the people with whom they've worked. So I should declare the interest of the ag to a kind of bang in the middle of the table uh, <laughs> in that respect. Um, but the, yeah. the Apache are hunter-gatherers still? Sorry? The Apache are still hunter-gatherers? Uh, this was historical data mostly, yeah. I mean, there's a few kind of uh, slightly weird ones in there. And also, with this sort of thing, you've also be got to be careful in controlling for, obviously, closely related groups do similar things for the, for the same reason. They're not all independent data points. Um, but uh, the, uh, the overall take home is you know, that there is diversity. You also need life history variation, don't you? Okay. Well? That's true, yeah, that's true. Yeah, actually, I mean, that's the one thing. The way I was talking about residence systems is like where, do, where does a newly married couple go once they get married? Do they live with? But actually, I think in ACTA, often, well, you know, it's just as likely that, say, uh, an elderly couple will move to live where their grandchildren have just been born. You know, that's, I think there's mobility throughout life and it's not that helpful to characterize it as just where do you live once you get married. Um. Oh yeah, so uh, the two kind of take homes from the literature and from our work as well, I suppose, is the hunter-gatherers uh, don't live in camps of close kin as assumed in the Paul C. Bright quote. Oh. Um, they live with a large number of unrelated individuals and they also live in groups where there's flexible um, residence. Um, and so I wondered whether these two were actually linked. I mean, the claim was made in, um, in this, uh, this paper by Kim Hill that the low relatedness of hunter-gatherer bands is surprising, but Actually, I mean, it's surprising compared to what? what what's, what's the null hypothesis? Um, what would it look like, for example, if the actor just randomly assorted into camps? How, how would, is the observed degree of relatedness among the actor greater than you'd expect by random assortment? Or are they actively avoiding kin? Are they, you know, trying to get away from their, from their brothers and sisters? Um, and then you can say, well, what would it look like if they were patrilocal, if men if the sole aim of men was to, their, if their sole motivation in residence was to try and live with as many male kin as possible, or alternatively, what would it look like if they were matrilocal? Um, and it's, these are obviously counterfactual questions, but you can get at it through uh, agent-based modeling, where you set up a simple scenario and you apply rules. Um, and so that's what I did to try and get at this. I wanted to ask whether sex equality in residential decision-making where both men and women have kind of equal clout in deciding where their, camp, where their household are going to move to, whether that could explain the relatively low relatedness we see in, in these groups. So I'll try and... Uh, I'll, it, it's an agent-based model, but it's actually... It's really a pen and paper model. Um, what we do in this model is to imagine an empty camp. So... Uh, and we want to populate it with individuals, and in, those individuals are making choices about who they want to bring to this community. So we can start off with a married couple, say, so let's, the triangles are male, uh, circles are female, the equal signs mean they're, they're married. So we've got two individuals, so that's our starting point. Um, and let's say, let's, let's choose one of these individuals at random, um, and uh, female number one, say, and allow her to bring um, a related individual into the community. Uh, and let's say that this is always a primary kin, so a sibling, parent, or child. But let's assume there's kind of sex quality in, in who can move. Uh, and let's say that she can bring male or female kin into the community. And let's say that she randomly brings in uh, a brother, male number three, and his wife. So individual, new individuals always bring their spouse, um, <coughs> who's unrelated to everyone else. So now we've got four individuals, and we can choose one at random and apply the same rules. So we've chosen individual number two, who has randomly chosen to bring his mother in, and let's assume that his mother's uh, husband is also his father. I mean, you can relax these kind of assumptions, uh, but let's go with this. And then we randomly choose again, and individual three is chosen to bring, they bring their daughter and their daughter's spouse, and so on and so forth. So we can go to 10 individuals as here, or we can keep going until we get to 20, which is what we observed in the ag term. And in this case, we can see, this is the sort of thing, this is the sort of genealogy that is typical 
for a camp. Individuals might have one or two primary kin, uh, but they'll also, they also might be living with the kin of their spouse. So we can run this model, this kind of agent-based model, where we apply two different kinds of rules. We can do it as I just described, which is an egalitarian uh, uh, scenario where both men and women are equally likely to be randomly chosen to bring kin to ca into the camp, uh, and those kin can be either male or female. And then we can have, I'll describe it as non-egalitarian, but really it's a pa either a patrilocal or matrilocal scenario, you, you can do it either way, it doesn't matter, where only one sex can influence the composition of the camp. So let's say that only women can bring uh, kin in and they bring their sisters, they can't bring their brothers or son. So it's, you've got two simple kind of scenarios which are analogous to bi-local residents uh, and uh, sex-biased um, residents. So when we do this, um, you can run this um, uh, thousands of times and take the average across all your simulations and produce a kind of expected distribution uh, based, on, based on the model assumptions. So in the egalitarian scenario, uh, this was what came out. This is what we expect uh, camp composition to look like if agents are following these kind of standard <coughs> bilocal egalitarian rules. Uh, in the non-egalitarian, so patrilocal or matrilocal context where one sex makes, kind of calls the shots, uh, we see that relatedness is much higher, about, around a third of individuals uh, of dyads are a genetic kin and the majority of the rest are affinal kin and there are hardly any completely unrelated individuals, it's just a small sliver. Um, and these um, uh, results, these, yeah, these kind of expected distributions fit quite nicely what we actually observed. So this is the data for the Agta um, Bayaka, and we can see that there's a general <laughs> correspondence around half of individuals are, uh, are distantly related or, or unrelated. I also collected a smaller data set for um, the farming neighbours of the Agta who are patrilocal. The core of the community is, is male kin and women marry into other villages. And in this case, relatedness is, um, is, is higher and uh, uh, perhaps it's kind of halfway between the two. This is, this is quite an extreme, um, extreme case. But we see broad correspondence between the model results and the observed. So I argued based on this that, um, that actually bi-local residents and sex equality and residential decision making actually pr in this weird kind of counterintuitive thing when everyone is trying to live with as many kin as possible no one ends up living with that many kin at all whereas if one sex gets to, to do the deciding then you can have a very closely related group of kin who form the core of a community that could be men or women um, so to reiterate basically what I said the, the low relatedness of hunter-gatherer bands is not necessarily a product of indifference toward living with kin uh, modelling suggests that a strong individual level preference for living with kin can still result in low relatedness at group level if adults live with an unrelated spouse and both sexes can influence residential decision making. Actually that kind of living with, living with an unrelated spouse is something I, I kind of just assumed, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really justify that but um, of course the whole community could be kin if you didn't care about living with an unrelated spouse but generally people um, do like to do that. So, um, so what? Um, as Chris said, this, this paper got some fun headlines. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. So, I, I think the, the left hand, I think the, le the male online one is actually very accurate. Um, the one on the right, I, I, li I always like the say scientists kind of. <laughs> Uh, ending. Oh, and it got a whole load of comments. We, I should have fished some of them, put them up. Inclu yeah, including quite rude things about me. Tell us some of them. <laughs> well, one of them was like, oh, who is the smart diver? I bet he's, um, I bet he has a ponytail and wears, um, <laughs> <laughs> wears sandals. Um, and then some ruder things, which were probably moderated or something. Um, but it provokes a lot of debate, which was quite fun. Um, this is probably a bit rude, but, I, you know, you've got to you got to take it. Um, but my, so uh, effectively what's going on here is 
the paper seeing um, the title of the paper was uh, Sex Equality Explains the Unique Structure of Hunter Gatherer Bands. So they see a paper about sex equality in hunter gatherers, and that's the conclusion of the, of the study they decide. Even though it was, I mean, it was a relatively cautiously written piece. Um, saying that sex equality and residential decision making might reduce the relatedness of hunter-gatherer bands, uh, but they took it to be that sex equality in hunter-gatherers, which is broadly true, so I'm not that upset about it. Um, but my kind of my spec my speculation on the basis of it um, is that so if living in flexible, bilocally dispersing groups, so fluid composition was the norm in human evolutionary history as it is among most contemporary hunter-gatherers. Um, it may have provided a few things. First, um, living with non-kin is, well, I think in the, across mammals in, in general, living with non-kin is either associated with uh, complete indifference. Um, Sorry, Bob. Yeah. Can you define non-kin? Um, ah, well, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> Mm. Your, you know, your kin is genetically related. Mm. Some cultures, it's not necessarily. That's well, no, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Um, and in fact, I've tried to. I, I could never go all the way to explaining, um, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, fictive kin and 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 so on. But there's always been an assumption that genetic relatedness is what it's all about, uh, and therefore our final kin are genetically unrelated, so they're non-kin. But I've actually written a piece recently where I've argued that our final kin, so your in-laws, um, you're not genetically related to them, but you are genetically related to their children. So you, you gain uh, what we would call indirect fitness benefits. You propagate your genes by helping them to reproduce. Uh, and I think we should reconceptualize relatedness from being about shared genetic ancestry to shared reproductive interest in the next generation. I think that, and I think that's entirely compatible with standard inclusive fitness theory. But um, so, uh, but in this, but I agree that in some cases kinship is. So I'm going off what I think is kinship here. Basically, I, I'm I'm kind of saying. Um, although actually, to be fair, uh, the Agta kinship system is does. It, it's basically um, a Hawaiian. Um, so, no, sorry. Um, yeah, es what's our es es Eskimo? Eskimo. Eskimo. Sorry. Yeah, if that's yeah. whatever we have, yeah. Um, so it's basically the same as ours anyway. Plus they recognize a few extra things like biaffines, so your, your, um, so your wife's brother's wife. They have a word for that, whereas we don't. So they go a bit further in some cases. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm really talking about genetic relatedness or, or individuals with whom you have a shared reproductive interest, let's say. Um, but living with you know, genetically unrelated individuals to, to kind of, basically cooperation between kin is quite easily explained from an evolutionary point of view. You have a genetic interest in your kin. But cooperating with unrelated individuals requires uh, demanding, so it requires social intelligence, um, big brains and, you know, social cognition. Um, so I think it is important from the point of view of thinking about the the evolution of the human brain to recognize that we probably we were living with and negotiating relationships with unrelated individuals which is you know requires the big brains to to kind of do the processing M keeping track of all those third party relationships and reputation and gossip and all this um, the and secondly by living in a fl more fluid um, uh, social system where you can move between communities, although you might just be living in a small community of 20 individuals at one time, you'll be part of a greater meta-group, as it were, um, which might have a population of several hundred or thousand individuals. And that's really critical for um, cultural, um, technological innovations to spread and be improved upon. Cumulative culture, uh, the human capacity for human, cumulative culture to come up with new technologies is of course in part about our, us being smart but actually it's also to do with us living in large groups and it's a social thing we tra transmit ideas between each other and the more people you have the great the larger a pool of people you have to share ideas and innovate um, the faster things get going um, so it may also say something about that and on a more kind of economic level 
if you have, um, you know, especially in a group like the Agta, you need to have a kinship tie in a community to, um, to live there. So while having a widely dispersed network of kin, you kind of have an insurance policy. If, if the foraging is not good where you are, you have a large number of other communities, um, both your communities and your spouse's communities, where you are entitled to live. Uh, and that's a good insurance policy against kind of local uh, environmental failure. Um, yeah, so that's the end. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of this was done in collaboration with the people on the left, and these are some references, but I think I might be able to, I think I'll put them on the website. Um, okay.